evening, everyone. Welcome to this breakout session, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, right now, we will aim to discuss how technological innovation can bolster prosperity and uh, accelerate um, the growth of emerging economies. We have an excellent cohort of panelists, which we'll go through in two different panels later. But before we begin, we'll hear a few comments from Engineer Omar Al Ansari. He's the Secretary General of QRDI Council. Thank you for joining us and let's begin. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And a very warm welcome to many of you who are visiting us from abroad to the third edition of the Qatar Economic Forum. Welcome to Qatar. Perhaps the best way to kickstart a conversation about leveraging new technologies in emerging markets is to give you an example of leveraging new technologies in an emerging market. Qatar is an emerging market. Generative AI is a new technology. So I asked ChatGPT to give me a joke that I can use in, in today's opening remarks. So I asked it, and it responded, why did the emerging market startup hire a magician? Because they needed someone who could turn their limited resources into unlimited possibilities. Maybe not the funniest of jokes from ChatGPT, <laughs> but I think the moral of the story is, do we really need to use magic to realize unlimited possibilities from our emerging economies? I hope in the chat today we'll conclude that maybe it's not so much magic, but certain work that we need to put in. And so the topic of the session then is very important, especially given the uncertainties of today, global financial instability, climate change, wars, and potentially out of control AI, we don't know. And so emerging economies, we know, are extra sensitive to these global uncertainties. For emerging economies, these uncertainties represent potentially new obstacles towards us achieving our national goals, our aspirations, and overcoming our challenges. QRDI, or the Qatar Research Development and Innovation Council in Qatar, is also an organization mandated and working towards advancing the science, technology, and innovation agenda in Qatar. But we never view our mandate only with a local lens. After all, in our mission, we strive to achieve this by empowering locally, but also being globally connected. But what does globally connected mean to us in Qatar? It means that, for example, our universities are open to international students from all over the world, especially from emerging economies, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Morocco, Egypt, Ghana, Rwanda, Mongolia. And for the first time this year as well, even from countries that I never learned about when I was a child, such as Eswatini and Lesotho, for example. It also means that our scientific researchers, funded by our own Qatar National Research Fund, collaborate with their international peers across the world, but most certainly in emerging markets, to address challenges that are relevant to their markets and their people. It means that multi multinationals such as Iberdrola and Total are building regional R&D hubs in Doha, attracting top regional scientists, engineers, designers, and other R&D professionals to innovate new solutions that are relevant to their region and to the world. For us at QRDI, technology is always a means to an end, and that end should be about making lives better for more and more people. Within the hands of positive change makers, technology is a powerful enabler. The transformative power of innovative solutions powered by emerging technologies and new business models has the potential to unlock previously unimaginable pathways towards sustainable development and prosperity for us all. I look forward to the panel's discussions today, and I hope that it is just the beginning of a more fruitful conversation and potentially productive partnerships and a realization that maybe it's not just about magic, that we can do a lot in this area. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you so much, Omar, for these words. I think it's an excellent introduction to our panel. Um, this first one will focus on leveraging innovation in emerging economies and will aim to decipher the trends, opportunities, and challenges that emerging economies pose for tech startups as well as investors. Please welcome my panelists uh, to the stage. Um, first off, we have Matthias Rebelius, who is the Global Chief Executive Officer at Siemens Smart Infrastructure. Thank you. We also have Courtney Powell, Chief Operating Officer and Managing Partner at 500 Global. Dr. Ola Brown, founding partner of Healthcare Capital Africa. And of course, Naveen Gupta, who is the managing director of South Asia and Middle East at Triple. As I promised you, this is an excellent cohort, so uh, I will spare no time and let's kick off our questions. Addressing that key theme that I just mentioned, what are the opportunities and challenges that emerging economies po pose to technology companies and technologies, uh, as well as the investors. Matthias, what's your outlook on that? Uh, that that's a broad question, of course. Broad. And I'm representing here Siemens, uh, which is, you know, uh, since, since 1847, we are addressing emerging markets and emerging um, countries with uh, our emerging technologies and we have ex you know we have also developed ourselves into a different company over over years how do we do this and why is this important to emerging markets it is the way of we are a technology company so we are leveraging technology for a purpose and the purpose of today is about of course we all talk about digitalization yeah? and chat gpt giving jokes or speeches or whatever um, but this is just a means of doing something better. So we have to manage complexity in existing markets and in emerging markets by using digitalization to drive sustainability. And how do we get the best knowledge and the best um, um, resources into, into these teams? We do this and leveraging for, for emerging technology in, perhaps in five, five different ways. So either you, do a, um, you have a startup within the company which, where you you have to manage it differently, you know, also in a large corporation like ours, manage it like a startup in the company. Or you, um, you, you acquire a startup, new technology, and, inc inc and, and incorporate this into the existing development or the, the, the corporation. Um, on the other side also, you, we have um, Next47, which is a venture arm, you know, for, for Siemens, where we, um, like a corporate venture capital, work with startups, develop them, challenge them, and um, leverage their technology. Not all of them will be success, and that is important. You know, allow also failure. Mm -hmm. And the other ones uh, are then the two, two remaining ones are going as a venture, a joint venture, for example, which we did also here with uh, Captain Energy in the, in, in, in the Emirates for the region uh, to develop um, uh, solar power, uh, for example. So venture capital is something where we then can incorporate or just work together with in creative customers who and about partnering, no one, no company can do it alone. We need to partner uh, with, uh, with them and then addressing new markets uh, like uh, also, for example, a Swedish startup um, and, uh, which, where, we, um, uh, where we work together also for the region um, to, to drive technology and development in, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. And, you know, taking that and building on it, Courtney, uh, you work with 500 different companies uh, globally and, you know, comparing developed markets to emerging markets, where do they shine and where can there be a little bit more development? Sure. So uh, 500 Global is an early stage uh, venture capital firm. And we've actually invested in nearly 3,000 companies across 80 different countries. So we've had a long history of investing um, not just in the US, but globally. And that was really a decision based upon the belief that there is incredible talent in so many emerging markets that was just looking for access to capital, access to new markets to be able to grow businesses that support not just the technological innovation that um, is so incredible that we see out of these startups, but they're true contributors to GDP. 
Uh, we're interested in investing globally because we see founders who create companies that create jobs within their local economies. And from a financial perspective, as a financial investor, it's incredibly rewarding as well. Across our portfolio today, we have over 50 companies valued at over a billion dollars, and half of those companies have come from outside the U.S. So it's not just, um, a, it's certainly not a developmental uh, decision or initiative, it's a financial position, and we've seen extraordinary growth across startups um, in so many different markets, including here in the Middle East. Amazing. And Dr. Ola, when we were speaking before the panel, you had some very interesting thoughts, and I'd like to run through that again, um, especially the role of tech in emerging markets and in global growth, really, and how much of a contributor that is to GDP. Fantastic um, and, and really great question and something that I'm obviously <laughs> really passionate about. Um, I run Health Cap Africa, um, a recovering medical physician um, that um, now works in finance. And um, HealthCap invests in the big four African markets, so we invest in Egypt, we invest in South Africa, we invest in Nigeria, um, and we invest in Kenya. Together they make up 50% um, of African GDP, they're also the largest um, consumer markets, and we invest in pre-series A in two sectors, <coughs> healthcare and financial technology. Um, and um, in terms of the opportunity, um, and I love talking about opportunities, historically Africa has focused on hard infrastructure bridges, roads, airports, power stations. Um, this is where um, sort of the um, largest infrastructure, um, the largest sort of proportion of investment has gone. Um, and um, I think that's interesting because these are the things that we thought would lift those one billion people um, currently living in poverty out of poverty. This is what we thought would create um, the most jobs. Um, but unfortunately, um, the data actually tells, tells a very different story. Um, in America, only 0.2% uh, of GDP goes into venture capital. But venture capital-backed companies are responsible for tw almost 25% of the economy. So almost a quarter of the American economy has come from only 0.2% um, of money going into venture. So venture has a huge, huge bang for the buck, if you know what I mean, a huge um, effect on the economy, even though it's a really um, small, um, um, relatively small amount in terms of allocation. A big opportunity that I see in um, Africa is the exponential growth in mobile and internet access. Um, I think it's one of the fastest developing and consumer markets in the world. Um, in terms of venture capital per capita in Singapore, the per capita, so per person, um, there's about $1,000 of uh, venture capital invested per person in Singapore. In most parts of Africa, it's $1 or $2. But if you look at the number of unicorns in Singapore and Africa, it's the same. We'll probably have more unicorns in, in, in Africa than Singapore going forward. So for a tiny amount of venture capital, you see a huge amount of, of really big companies. Um, and I think, you know, um, I, when I finished my rotation in clinical medicine, I lived in Tokyo. Um, so the biggest shock moving from Tokyo to Africa was the growth rates. Um, in... Japan, right now, they sell more adult diapers than baby diapers. The economy, like the de in, in terms of demographics, um, they're shrinking in population. Um, so moving from Japan to a country like Nigeria that is growing at 4% absolutely blew my mind. There were more babies born in Nigeria this year than in the whole of Europe. Um, so the opportunity in terms of the consumer market in emerging markets um, really, really um, excites me. Um, and I think, you know, it reminds me of when um, countries like uh, China and Vietnam um, were entering that rapid growth stage. I see that inflection point um, happening for um, Africa as well. Um, so in terms of the opportunity, I think, for uh, the markets that I invest in, um, it's around the venture capital per capita and that arbitrage opportunity a very small amount of money doing very big things. It's around the explosion um, in mobile um, money. It's around the explosion in population. Um, during the COVID pandemic, I had to dabble back into medicine um, again because there was a shortage of doctors. Um, but like in states like Florida, for example, you're seeing the average age of 50, 60, 60 mm -hmm. in some American states. The average age in Africa is 19. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these things, um, you know, 
point us in the direction of probably what I call the last frontier um, for rapid growth in the world. Um, and that's what really excites me. And in financial technology, particularly, this is an area that we invest in, fintech and health tech only, um, we see actually a comparative and competitive advantage in financial technology. Africa is a spiritual home, I would say, of fintech, the first real mobile money um, um, applications, really innovation in banking infrastructure. Um, companies like M-Pesa really changed the game in terms of the first real digital currency in the world. Um, so because of these reasons, I'm super excited about the opportunities in digital. Excellent. Thank you. And Naveen, I think you work in a quite a different sector than what everyone else works in. You know, walk me through. Um, I think blockchain has so much to grow, uh, has so much room to grow here, but also the challenges. I'm sure there are plenty in, this re in the, um, the emerging economy. It's True. So let's just take a very simple example, because this will be relevant to everybody here in the room, um, is just the cost of, for SMEs. So if you look at an SME in a country, generally they would pay 15 20% in an emerging market. In a more developed market, they'll pay 5%, 6% in terms of cost of capital. And this has been true for the last 100 years since, since this has been around. Small companies in an emerging market pay more, right? Now, let's look at the problem that we are trying to solve. So for example, cross-border remittances. So today, um, Oman, which is quite close to Qatar, let's assume somebody from Qatar is a buyer, they're buying from a farm in Oman 200 tons of um, tomatoes, right? So, and easily tomatoes can come, probably next day they'll get delivered to here in Qatar. But the money, when it moves from Qatar, from SAR to Omani Real, it'll take three days. Mm -hmm. So let's assume you are that supplier and your terms are net 30 days. That means as a supplier in Oman, you'll receive the money on the 33rd day. Right? which means that you lose 36 days of working capital in a year. Right? Now, if we were to eliminate that by just making remittances instant um, to, to people where they need most, then you would eliminate and add 36 days of working capital with that supplier. So suddenly, with the same amount of money, you get 10% more productivity because you get one month more of working capital that can essentially go through the system where you can have better profits and you can essentially generate more money on the capital that is invested, lowering your cost of capital and productivity increases. So these are the things that we are bringing to bear in terms of blockchain to say, hey, how do we eliminate friction that today essentially forces or does not allow smaller players, SMEs, to go global, right? Though physically they are able to, they just have to drive across the border, at least in the GCC, and to sell their goods, but through artificial friction, like uh, friction remittances, they are not able to get their money in time. So how to make that more productive and use the power to a blockchain to do it. And these are tons of other practical examples as well, where blockchain can be used for good, and it, its power can be harnessed by people on the ground every day. Excellent. It's such a fascinating world, and we'll talk more about it, I'm sure. And Matthias, to you, I come back, and I think Siemens, being the, com the giant company that it is, you have a lot of different partnerships. And I think partnerships is a very important theme in how we can uh, bolster tech innovation in emerging markets that can help them grow. So what role can partnerships between venture capitalists, tech investors, governments, and companies like yours play in that um, framework? Yeah, and uh, I, I tried to give that already in the first answer a little bit, saying that how we do it and working together with startups, with venture mm -hmm. capital, on our own or with others, it's about partnering, about the, also you know, learning from other sectors. And going into emerging markets, uh, in the past it was, oh, I think 10 years, 20 years ago, you, you took the kind of older technology and you brought it somewhere and said, okay, it's good enough for the purpose. Now it's the opposite, you know, now to be fast and with the growth in population, you need the best technology and that is not a contradiction anymore. This is for me also very inspiring and exciting for a company like ours to work with partners. And, and in the example, was, uh, what I wanted to say before was the, the, the Swedish startup, uh, which is a way out, you know, they make... Uh, uh, containers for water conservation, mm -hmm. you know, and we can standardize also the use of clean water out of every source of uh, wastewater you have. You can create uh, clean drinking water mm -hmm. at uh, resources which is scarce, which is important all over the place, and also especially in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. So what we what we do there is, you know, we provide the technology, and this technology is not old tech. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the modern SCADA system. This is even edge and cloud-based controllers because sometimes you are in rural areas or remote, but you nevertheless want to have the data. You want to work also remotely because we are not always present everywhere ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
So bringing new technology into emerging markets, solving a, a very relevant need, you know, and in this case, either it be it, uh, as I saw before, before about renewable energy with solar investments, or with hydrogen, mm -hmm. with vertical farming for um, food scarcity and, and, and you know, food supply mm -hmm. and sec food security, I should say, uh, or even then now the, the example with, with water. So the combination of technology with a purpose, mm -hmm. what we, we can bring to the table, and partnering. So partnering, to come back to your question, is very important. It, um, no company can do it alone, also not giant companies, as you called us, which is uh, uh, perhaps not the, the expression I would use. You know, it's about technology companies and open for partners, and that's also what we are here to invite others, and that's why we're also participating in such panels and such forums mm. to find partners and to see who can jump onto our platforms, which are more open than in the past. So how easy is it to find these talents in, the, in emerging economies and even the region? Yeah, so on talent development, this is the same. So we also, we just signed an MOU also here today with uh, Qatar Invest, where we then go into also uh, education, um, uh, internships. We want to have local talents that we, um, that we build out on our technologies that then go work in the countries, but also abroad. We do this also in India. You were talking about the, the young population and, and growing population in Nigeria. It's not so much different in Egypt, it's not so much different in India, which is now the largest single population in the world, where we have a local presence, and we tap the, uh, as Siemens, also the infrastructure in these countries. So we need talent mm -hmm. locally, and we develop them, and therefore it's very much important to invest also in education, in uh, research uh, centers, the other part of today was a discussion about an engineering and design center. So localized technology based on a global platform. And here again, digitalization enables us to work together in a much more networked and global way than it was in the past. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And for you, Courtney, um, what, how, how do you work on talent development, but also going back to that question on partnerships, uh, what does that look like to you? Yes, I think partnerships are, are so critical, especially when uh, with regard to emerging markets. So 500, um, of course, is a, is a venture capital investor, but because we have been investing for so many years in nascent and emerging markets, we have found a lot of success partnering with governments to help design a pathway to accelerate a startup ecosystem. So when we're coming into a market, we're not just looking to deploy capital, we're also working with the government on the policy platforms and the regulatory frameworks that need to exist in order to enable startups to not just start, but also ultimately get access to sandboxes, to exit, et cetera. We're looking at what the local uh, capacity building needs are with regard to venture capital, angel, inv angel investors, even family offices that are all really important parts of investors into a startup ecosystem. And ultimately, you know, first, we're looking to build a local team, right? We want a sustainable startup ecosystem uh, to, to result from the work that we're contributing to. And so we spend a lot of time partnered with governments uh, to understand what the, the gaps are and then partnering with other corporates and, uh, and uh, education systems to make sure that there is a real capacity to have a sustainable ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we actually partnered with Next47 uh, in Mumbai mm -hmm. uh, to create capacity there uh, with regard to corporate venture capital uh, in right. India. So. Um, a lot of incredible partnerships are what makes an ecosystem work, and I think it's um, more important than ever, especially in fast-growing markets like we're seeing um, here across the Middle East and Africa. Um, all of these things are really critical. Amazing. And Ola, for you, what's your experience in Africa building those partnerships, and what does that look like? Um, I'll say that there's sort of two really interesting um, partnerships that... I think are important. Um, number one is um, foreign direct investment and institutional um, investment partnerships. And I think back to um, you know the days when America was building its infrastructure. Um, a lot of the money came from Europe, and people didn't uh, quite appreciate that. A lot of the money came actually from the financial centres. Um, it was moved from all over Europe into the financial centres um, of London and Paris, and then physically shipped um, in cash. 
um, right across the sea uh, to America. And, and bankers like JP Morgan made their name because they could intermediate those uh, relationships between large European institutional investors and families. Um, and he could deploy it to railroads and um, bridges and whatever they were building in America. And the reason why people trusted JP Morgan was that um, it, they knew that they would get their money back. So he was in charge of actually, you know, when profits were made, putting the money back on a ship in physical cash and um, shipping it back to London and then um, using the intermediaries to get back to Germany or France or wherever. Um, so um, the, complex, the complexity of the process of foreign investment is a lot more simple today um, than it was then. Um, uh, but I think that the fundamentals um, are still the same. Um, there are sort of boring, low, um, uh, low uh, sort of ROI markets um, where, you you know, they're not as dynamic as emerging markets where you can make stable returns. Um, but to get that um, more uh, dynamism um, and um, higher ROI, ROI in a portfolio, um, there's um, a need to invest in, um, in, in emerging markets exactly like the European um, investors did, um, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and I think that that's where, you know, you can get those, um, those alpha returns. Um, so I think partnering with international institutions um, for... Um, in Af uh, growth in Africa, both from a returns perspective and from an impact perspective, um, is a really essential partnership and a really essential source of, part um, source of partnering. And the reliability of those partners and fund managers um, is also important. Track record is important. Reputation is important. Um, and as important as it was um, 100 years ago. Um, and then the second is government. Um, I think that people really underestimate um, the importance of sovereigns. Um, when building a technology um, technology ecosystem. Um, and in America, for example, um, the US government is estimated um, is uh, an investor in 25% of all the money that goes into um, early stage startups comes directly or indirectly from the US government. And even in the UK, um, publicly funded university systems, for instance, um, um, I recently read that Cambridge University, um, which receives public funding, um, is a larger contributor to the UK economy than the European Premier League. Um, so you can see that um, the uh, sort of research and development and innovation that comes out of the university system that is publicly funded um, is actually a huge contributor um, to, to economic growth. Um, so partnering with government is absolutely essential. And even in my own industry, um, healthcare, 75% of new molecules, new drug molecules um, developed in the US are funded on the back of some kind of government grant or loan. Um, and one of the most exciting um, things in health tech now is the advent of personalized medicine. Um, so medicine, when I was doing medicine, um, was about doing the least amount of harm um, so we give the same drug to absolutely every single person and hope it works for most people, um, but some people have terrible drug reactions and some people die, um, but we can, you know, most people um, will be okay. Um, but since, um, since I was in medical school, we've started looking at more personalized approaches to medicine, um, looking at medicine design for people's specific genomics, um, and uh, the American government spent about 3.8 billion dollars on the human genome project, mapping the entire human genome. And since then, people have been building um, drugs and startups and pieces of the um, health tech ecosystem on the back of that American government spending. And that $3.8 billion has now produced over a trillion dollars um, in, in, in um, activity in the ecosystem in, in terms of health tech. But unless the American government had put in that initial money, the entire ecosystem that was, has been built in genomics and um, personalized medicine probably wouldn't have been built because I don't think any private sector player would have necessarily taken that, um, that kind of risk. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, 25% of early stage funding, 75% of new drug molecules, all of these mega products, even if you think about Google, Tesla, Amazon, at some point they've all collected American government money. Okay. If you think about SpaceX, for example, 10% of, um, of NASA's budget goes to SpaceX. So the government as a customer, the government as an investor, the government as an investor in private universities yeah. is absolutely essential. Yeah. Um, I would say that American taxpayers mm -hmm. are probably the biggest <laughs> investors in technology. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're not getting any carry. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a very interesting point. And going to that government being super important, Naveen, how does that look like when it comes to 
blockchain regulation. It's still in the very early stages, I would argue, uh, but you know better. So you can just walk us a little bit through how that looks like for you. Yeah, so let's look at example of Silicon Valley, right? So I was in the Valley in 2000 when it was taking off. It had three ingredients, right? So first, it had money, it had talent, but also for the internet, America had the best regulations, right? Uh, I mean, most of the internet companies could essentially ship their goods uh, free of sale tax from any state in the world. So they had actually an advantage over goods being uh, physically bought, right? Uh, and the enabling regulation does help for our industry to leapfrog, or at least to give, us, uh, give it some, let's call it, core area where it can essentially succeed. And that's true about blockchain as well, or all, all emerging techs. It could be AI, it could be blockchain, or others. So, and right now there is, you can call it, regulatory arbitrage or regulatory uh, positioning that's happening across, um, um, let's say, money centers around the world. So for example, Singapore, UAE, UK, m Europe with MICA is hugely progressive. America is not, for example, for blockchain, just as an example. Uh, so regulation is very important, particularly for emerging tech, to essentially let hundreds of entrepreneurs succeed where the intention is correct and the output is a little bit unknown. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't happen, and th had that not happened in America, we wouldn't have had Silicon Valley to the scale and size in terms of what we see today. Mm -hmm. So to me, regulation, and not just regulation, very progressive regulation, letting people, firms experiment, let's, letting firms scale up, letting firms die, is critical to the success. And some countries will get it right, and some countries will not. Yeah. And I mean, the time of our panel is approaching to a close, so I will uh, do something a bit different for this last question. Very briefly, uh, I'd like to hear from each and every one of you what you think are the under-penetrated um, sectors in emerging markets that we can use tech to kind of um, help bolster. Um, I mean, it's something that I'm sure you look at many different sectors, Matthias. So what does that look like for you? Yeah, so for, for us, of course, uh, what I do see is where investment is being needed is definitely on in terms of the electrification of the world, mm -hmm. yeah, because that is where everything starts, you know, it's about uh, the grid uh, expansion, it's about renewable um, expansion, it's about intelligent um, leverage of it, so grid management, so that is where um, companies like ours, but also then lots of startups are working and investing why is this under leverage? Because if you look into the huge amount of renewable energy that is expected to, um, to, to, to which, is, which is needed to turn around the world from 20% fossil to 80%, uh, 20% renewable to 80%. So we have to, to really flip it around. One, if you imagine you build, we would build all the renewable programs that are being announced globally, the bottleneck will be the grid. Mm -hmm. And the grid management, that again is a combination of the real and the digital world, means the grid electrification systems plus the intelligent management of it. Mm -hmm. And this is where I see it will be decisive mm -hmm. for uh, not only emerging markets, but for the entire planet. Mm -hmm. And definitely an area to, uh, to focus on investment. The, the problem is it needs capex. But then, and that's to cut it short here, it's, uh, it's important to move from, instead of capital expense, go to operation expense, means have as a service mm -hmm. business model, which make it a lot more affordable and tailored to the needs of emerging markets, but also okay. larger uh, economies. So that is definitely, and that again needs digitalization, cloud platforms and technology. Great, great. Um, again, I'm conscious of the time, so Courtney, very briefly, what, what, what are the key sectors for you? Uh, I think education across emerging markets is still really largely untapped. It's um, just <coughs> massive populations that have um, so oftentimes limited access to some of the things that we've seen in more advanced markets. So education is one. And then secondly, more from an investment standpoint, I would say B2B. B2B SaaS definitely has not been developed yet across many emerging markets. And I think there's a huge uh, upside to still seeing what can come uh, from serving a new client base there. Excellent. What about you, Dr. Ola, very briefly? Oh, you know I have a bias. <laughs> so I, I'm a doctor. My master's is in finance. My PhD is also going to be in finance, studying digital currencies um, on my thesis. So I would say that um, definitely the biggest opportunities um, are health tech and fintech. Fintech has produced one in five unicorns in the entire world. Um, the third biggest unicorn producing sector is health tech. Um, so those are the two industries that I focus on. And definitely, I think the two industries that are important for emerging markets. Thank you so much, yeah. Naveen. So like we think of clean clean water, clean air as fundamental rights. I would think of free internet or mm -hmm. internet accessibility to everyone and movement of money, electronic money for everyone. And you just have these all four 
and economies will just take off. Amazing. Thank you so much for this excellent discussion. And um, please, uh, everyone, uh, thank you so much. Help them. Thank them for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> The second panel will touch upon something a little bit different. So it's looking from the inside out and how we can use um, emerging market innovations to help scale up um, these technologies. And um, so it's again all about the potential of emerging market innovation. Uh, and for our speakers, uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome Her Honorable uh, Paula Ingaberi, the Minister of Information, Communication, Technology, and Innovation at the Republic of Rwanda. As well as uh, Engineer Omar Al Ansari, I'd like to welcome you back on the stage, who is the Secretary General yes. of QRDI. I'm good. Thank you. I'll just get off this and I'll come back. Yes. And Dr. Inma Martinez, a digital partner and artificial intelligence scientist who is also chair of the expert group at Global Partnership on AI. <laughs> Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, going back to that theme of the panel, uh, Engineer Omar, I'd like to speak to you about um, those trends that we can use to scale up and replicate uh, globally. I think Qatar was a great example last year and just a little bit more about what you do and how um, you know, these new innovations are coming into play in the, in the country. Oh, thank you. So at the Qatar Research Development and Innovation Council, our core mandate is to actually develop these capabilities, capabilities in R&D within the state. We've invested a lot over the last 20 years to develop scientific research capabilities, and so we see now the fruits of that investment and the fruits of that labor. But our next phase now is to, in a sense, complete the circle by also having private sector-led um, innovations. And of course, the private sector plays the critical role in um, capitalizing on these trends that you refer to. And I think what we're witnessing today, especially with AI, is a very important and disruptive trend. We can talk about a lot of trends, but I expect the conversation over the next couple of months most certainly will be about artificial intelligence and its ability to, to disrupt. And I think in the context of emerging economies, this is very important. Um, and it's very important for emerging economies due to the fact that I think some of the struggles and obstacles in different sectors in emerging economies are due to the lack of expertise or the lack of knowledge or the lack of specialization within those sectors. And if you think now to the power of generative AI to actually close those gaps very quickly and help in knowledge transfer, knowledge transfer of best practices, knowledge transfer that can help scientific breakthroughs, we have the ability to disrupt education, to disrupt healthcare in a way that can be much more accessible to a lot of people. Um, the key thing, though, is how do we ensure that we do that responsibly? How do we build the internal capabilities within our government institutions to know how to do these trade-offs between the benefits and the potential risks? And I think those capabilities and building them across our institutions is a focus we have, and I think it's a very important point of discussion. Excellent, excellent. And your minister, uh, you've done so much work. Smart Africa is a great example of these innovations and uh, how you know they've helped bring that prosperity that we're discussing today. So walk us a little bit about, again, how um, these homegrown innovations have helped uh, growth in emerging markets. Thank you very much. And, and perhaps I'll pick up from uh, the, the, the remarks that you made, uh, Engineer Omar, where you said, um, you know, Qatar is an emerging economy. I think for Rwanda, would, how we are positioning ourselves is a proof of concept, um, a nation, a, a place where you can come and innovate and leverage, you know, uh, fourth industrial revolution technologies to really uh, create uh, relevant solutions to some of the challenges that we deal with. And we've seen a couple of those examples. Just yesterday, um, uh, when our president was, had the interview, he did talk about Zipline as one of the examples. And the story behind Zipline is that when we chose to use drones to deliver medical products and emergency products to some of our healthcare facilities in rural parts of the country, where really the alternative would have been to find lots of investments to invest in uh, cold room infrastructure, thinking about accessibility to those places and figuring out what's the most efficient and cost-effective way to do this. Um, and so when 
we had, there was a solution with Zipline to use drones. There was a challenge on our hand to figure out how to deliver healthcare services better and much uh, more efficiently. And at that point, there were no, uh, you know, globally agreed on set of regulations around um, how you use and fly drones. And so for Rwanda, we had the choice between do, you, do we sit and wait until someone figures out some regulations around how to use drones, or do we uh, really, in positioning ourselves as a proof of concept market, be bold enough to test and try some of these innovations and use uh, that proof of concept to then create um, you know, relevant uh, regulations that then actually have born um, you know, uh, a very vibrant drone in, local drone industry in Rwanda. And so what is the impact of that? So not only are we looking at uh, better healthcare delivery, um, thanks to the use of drones and how we can deliver emergency products much faster. Uh, but at the same time, what we're seeing we, is also the emergence of a drone economy within the country, and one where we're starting to see multiple drone use cases that are contributing beyond just healthcare, looking at agriculture and mining, uh, the construction field. And so that is really the impact of, uh, of how you can leverage some of these emerging technologies. And um, Engineer Omar talked about AI. AI is another area that we're looking at, whether it's from uh, the financial perspective on how we can uh, leverage AI tools to you know, minimize fraud, um, how we can use AI in healthcare, particularly um, as we think about AI for radiologists. And a particular example that we have in Rwanda is Today we have about um, you know, less than 20 radiologists for a population that's about 14 million. Uh, so what that means is, for us, there's that constant conversation on how we leverage technology um, to support in how we deliver all services to our citizens, including healthcare services. And so even using AI for radiology to improve on the work that the, the backlog of cases that radiologists have to deal with, being able to detect which are the most critical cases as opposed to fast, uh, you know, fast come, fast serve. And so all of that is really the benefits that we are starting to see as we open up as a country uh, that is really uh, ready uh, to test some of these innovations. Excellent. This is just, you know, exactly the theme that this panel is about, innovation that we can replicate, and that's such a great example. And then to you, Dr. and Mike, um, both of them already spoke about artificial intelligence, and I'm sure you have so much more um, to talk through us about that and how um, artificial intelligence is so important in the development of these new innovations in uh, emerging economies. Um, well, it is. It's the most disruptive technology that is uh, exerting massive effect in the world right now, although artificial intelligence has been developed for the last 60 years, it is now when we see its potentiality and also what is it that, as a civilization, we need to look out for in terms of how transformational we want it to be, but also how we want to preserve our culture and the way we want to live in the future. So it, it's, uh, and especially since September 22nd, when a massive large language model was put in the world in the hands of normal people, um, the uh, governments uh, are very, very concerned as to how to deal with it. The Global Partnership on AI uh, is the AI agency founded by the G7 and G20 countries, and it's a member country organization with 29 nations and about 150 AI scientists from these nations and other nations working together to actually make sure that AI is put in the world the way we need it. So it's interesting the example that you mentioned with radiology, because one of the greatest opportunities of developing nations is that if you bring artificial intelligence to solve problems, for example, image diagnosis, you don't have the barriers that you find in developed nations as to if I bring this machine that is going to not only detect cancer markers in blood, but will draw me a picture of the evolution of this cancer so that we can create a therapy, basically predicting the future evolution, is not taking anybody's job, mm -hmm. which is what is mentally stopping many AI solutions in developed nations. If I automatize this, or if I bring this detection tag, somebody's gonna lose a job. In developing nations, you need solutions for very specific problems, and if technology is going to come and help, 
you immediately deploy it. So these will create probably a future in which countries in development that pioneered many innovative technologies will become the first case studies of how that thing actually works. It's a massive opportunity. Mobile payments, Africa has about 300 million mobile payment accounts. Is the largest leading continent with mobile payments because it was deployed in Africa as a solution 20 years ago. I remember being at Nokia, and Nokia was one of the first hazard manufacturers that was developing mobile payment solutions. And now it's leading, leading beyond developed nations. So for me, AI and other technologies, they are the new infrastructure, the new infrastructure of progress. Um, I used to work in the financial industries when I was a young person, and I worked in infrastructure development, infrastructure finance, financing bridges and roads and energy projects around the world. You mentioned Iberdrola, a Spanish energy company. That was one of the companies I did work for. And when you build infrastructure, you're not really addressing the core problem. For example, the famous bridge between Copenhagen in Denmark and the city in Sweden of Malmo. When that project was conceived and built in the mid-1990s, it wasn't because Denmark and Sweden had a traffic management problem. It was because they wanted to create a hub, an innovation economic developed area for the two countries. In 20 years, this circle, this geography between Malmo and Copenhagen generates 27% of both nations' GDP combined. So it wasn't about cars, it was about progress, economic progress and social welfare. This is what we need to ask of technology today, which is the new infrastructure. Is it bringing economic progress? Is it bringing social equality? Is it bringing a better life for our people? Mm -hmm. And that is the bottom line of anything that we do with tech. You just touched upon all of the other questions I have moving forward, which is excellent. And I'll take one point that you mentioned and bring it back to you, Minister, um, about how AI is actually helping create jobs and not killing more jobs than it's at least creating. Mm -hmm. So how can the public and the private sector come together to reskill the workforce for the future in this age of artificial intelligence? So there are a couple of things, and, and again, I'll use some examples of some of the things that we're already doing in Rwanda. Um, and you ask, how can the public and private sector work together? One, uh, I think building the critical mass and talent pool is, is essential, uh, whether it's for purposes of jobs that are going to be created in the public sector and the private sector. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Rwanda, we've, create, we've been able to attract a partnership between uh, Carnegie Mellon University um, for the Africa campus. And I know here in Qatar, you already have a CMU as well uh, that is offering um, uh, you know, undergraduate level degrees. And for Rwanda, uh, it's more postgrad. But essentially, what we're doing is also focusing on what are those critical skills that are mm. required for the future, where we have uh, programs that are specialized in AI, on uh, machine learning, uh, data science, and being able to, to build that critical mass um, of, of talent. Then you have the Africa Institute for Mathematical Sciences as well that has established itself in Rwanda. It's PhD level. Mm -hmm. You have um, you know, uh, you know, students that are researching on these topics, but again, with a very particular context on how are we going to apply these emerging technologies, AI, IoT, to very specific challenges that we're solving for uh, in the continent. But one would even ask what then happens if you're going to take two to three years uh, program of skilling mm -hmm. and what we really need is you know, urgent skills that can get into uh, the marketplace, into the workforce. Are there other programs uh, that we can partner on that allow for a short-term short uh, type of trainings that you know, allow for the reskilling and upskilling to happen in a very uh, fast-paced manner to give us that talent? But beyond just creating the talent, there's also a need to create opportunities where they can use uh, the talent that, that they've been able to develop. And that's why, very specifically for us, we've adopted um, uh, a very uh, strategic focus on how we're leveraging data mm -hmm. 
uh, and using models, uh, AI models, uh, to really inform policy reforms, to inform uh, some of the programs and implementation uh, that we are really taking care of. And I think the partnership between public sector and private sector should not just be left uh, to creating the much needed talent. Obviously, it's a very fundamental mm -hmm. focus because without the talent, you won't be able to have innovators. And I know the theme of this conversation was around market creating innovations. If you don't tackle the talent uh, gap, then most likely you won't be able to create those innovators that are really uh, building solutions from scratch uh, that really respond to the, the, the unique context of the challenges that we have. But beyond that, I think we need to be able to match the ability to create talent with the ability to uh, you know, uh, uh, put in place early stage financing programs. Because the talent you're creating is not just going to look for employment. There are people who are going to create products. They're going to build companies. Mm -hmm. And for them, beyond the ideas and the talent that they have, they're going to need financing to take their ideas to the next level and bring them to the market. They're going to need the right policy and regulatory frameworks in place that support these innovations. And we know that many times policies and regulations are playing catch up when it mm -hmm. comes to innovations. Mm -hmm. But having that space and platform where you allow um, uh, to, to, to drive uh, that conversation that allows you to have the right policies and regulations, then we'll, we'll bring those products as well uh, onto the market. Excellent. And Engineer Omar, what about uh, what's happening in Qatar? How is that um, you know, effort to reskill the workforce, boost innovation taking place? What does that look like in QRDI? Yeah, I, I think um, though, for example, we could talk about the disruptive nature of AI, but in general, technology trends have always had this effect of making certain jobs uh, cancelled mm -hmm. and creating other jobs. If you think to now um, the notion of having social media content managers, as a job description. That is not something which existed a few years ago, but exists today. So whether it's AI or whether it's other types of technology trends, I think always as governments, we are having to keep an eye out mm -hmm. on the categories of jobs that will be canceled, but also seeing the opportunities for categories or new categories of jobs that will be, will be created. I think the, the essence though is we have to have a principle mm -hmm. that no one should be left behind. I think we're all in emerging economies working on building this innovation ecosystem. But I think we have the opportunity to do it in a principled way. And one of those principles is we should try to ensure, in the same way that we're trying to ensure that innovation is accessible and beneficial to as many people as possible, but we should also do it in a way where we don't leave people behind. And that includes people who, whose jobs may be uh, made um, redundant due to, due to uh, new technology trends. And so what do we have to do? We have to prioritize those kinds of jobs. And as government institutions, we have the ability to actually put some leverage and incentivize corporations as well to make this a priority. The second thing as well, I think we have the advantage in, in Qatar is integrated planning. You know, for example, right now, Qatar is going through its next cycle of national development planning. And we have the ability to do that in an integrated way, where we think about where do we want to go as an economy, economic diversification, and tie that quite nicely with our education priorities, tie that quite nicely to demographic policies, tie that quite nicely to research priorities. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to do integrated planning in Qatar, and I think we, we have the ability to do that in other emerging economies. And I think that's also a very useful lever that governments can do, which is integrated planning. Excellent. And Dr. Inma, going back to the last point that you mentioned about uh, artificial intelligence and the questions that we should look at when we're incorporating it. So, and I want to ask you, how are these uh, emerging technologies such as um, artificial intelligence transforming the way um, the public institutions are serving uh, their citizens. Um, we'll go back, of course, and speak to uh, our government officials, but uh, to you as someone who works with G7 and so on, what does that look like to you? Well, governments have the responsibility of uh, funding uh, whatever initiatives is going to create prosperity, more employment, innovation. That's obviously has been the strategy in the European Union, for example. But beyond that, and this is what it's emerging now, uh, as it was extremely rightly uh, pointed out, we now find ourselves at an inflection point as humanity in which we are almost touching certain aspects of science as gods. Mm -hmm. 
you know, for example, um, molecular uh, developments, you know, being able to uh, very quickly with AI uh, build the molecular structure of DNA. This is something that AlphaFold did in 2018. All of a sudden, we see ourselves almost recreating nature, something that was unthinkable 100 years ago. And it's at this moment in which ethics, equity, is when we start thinking what kind of world we want to build. We cannot leave anyone behind. We need to make a life that is fit for humans to live rather than an alienating life. So all of the products and solutions that are emerging in, for example, with artificial intelligence, they have to have the basis of it's really demonstrating that is alleviating a lot of hardships. For example, artificial intelligence in agriculture is completely transforming how arable land is, is being treated because every year due to climate change, but also very bad agricultural practices, arable land decreases. So we have less land to grow food for a much larger humanity of billions. And when you bring AI to the fields, immediately it has to demonstrate that you work with less effort, you have better yields for your crop. So it has to be monitoring that it brings an optimization, but also that it's something scalable that everybody else can use, that it's not a bespoke project um, brought by a university to a small farmer. No, this is really a way to create an industry and a transformative movement that can become uh, a case study and something deployable with scalability. Um, in, the, in the GPA, when I joined, I started leading AI in agriculture and livestock farming because um, it's one of the areas that is most radically going to change, but also healthcare. Also, what kind of cities are we building? Mm. Smart cities is a concept that began in 2000. I remember I was invited to come to Eindhoven in uh, Holland. Eindhoven is one of the super smart cities where they have innovated the most. And at the beginning was about putting internet on the streets. And then it was about sensorizing car parks and then bringing electric bicycles. But today, it's about waste management, oxygen levels, fighting pollution, mm -hmm. fighting mental health issues of people living in metropolis of more than 10, 15, 20 million people. So it's not about electric bicycles anymore. And I think, and I'm very excited that Doha is a footprint for anything you want to build on it. Yeah. Because it's a city of the future. Mm -hmm. It's got the infrastructure, it's got the blank page to start dreaming up how the cities in the future should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How technology can come and create an impact in this. And emerging markets mm -hmm. are the test bed of yeah. dreams. Yeah. That's so because true. you can build everything brand new on yeah. top of it. That's so true. That's so true. Uh, to you, Engineer Omar, uh, with Doha being the footprint, and um, so what are these experiences looking like? How is it serving um, the public? And very briefly, as again, I'm very, being very conscious of time. Right, I think, I think there's a lot of intersecting themes here. I think the minister talked about how you can be a proof of concept nation mm -hmm. and how you can leverage the challenges you have to drive, to drive innovation. I think one of the most recent examples in Qatar is the World Cup. Right. And so I think we can't have a story about Doha and not actually talk about the World Cup a little bit yeah. and the learnings from the World Cup. Not only was the event delivered and was a wonderful experience, but there was a side effect as well where innovations were actually deployed, developed and used. Just the example of the football itself, mm -hmm. which had 500 sensors in it and AI technologies powering it, all the way to the stadium 974, which is essentially built like Lego blocks which can be completely deconstructed and put somewhere else. Even to the stadium cooling, which mm. came from one of our universities mm. that was 40% more efficient than existing technologies, which is very hard, by the way, in a stadium which is open to the air. Um, and also accessibility to, to, to the blind, where Braille technology was used to give the blind mm. the, the beautiful experience of the World Cup. 
the, the moral of the story, though, is not to just kind of list all these, mm -hmm. these innovations. Mm -hmm. The moral is the ability for us as an emerging nation to actually use these missions. And I think there's a lot of discussion in different circles about mission-oriented mm -hmm. research, for example. So for us, the World Cup was a mission. Mm -hmm. And that mission we, could, we leveraged to actually do other things. Mm -hmm. I think the minister also talked about the example of delivering healthcare using drones, right? That's, that's in a way, that's a mission. So how can we actually have useful missions where we actually are intelligent about, our, uh, in a way, architecting those missions to drive and invite innovations? The examples I gave, in a way, forced opportunities to happen. Mm -hmm. It forced ideas that were in a university to come out of a university. It gave the opportunity to a local startup to have a place where they can test those technologies. It gave the opportunity to foreign innovators to test their solutions locally. So I think mission-oriented development mm -hmm. is, is useful. Um, there, are, there are other levers that we can deploy and we can talk to them, but I just wanted to throw that in the mix because I think it's very useful. Well, unfortunately, the session has run out of time, but this is an excellent way to wrap up, I think, our discussion. And thank you so much for your insight, and um, thank you all for attending. This was such a great session. Thank you.